Oh, goddess, no. Please don't let me die like this. I have too much to live for. Tanu leaned against the wall to avoid staggering, his arm wrapped around his stomach. The pain in his side was awful, and he bit his tongue to regain his focus and squeezed his eyes shut. It hurts. It hurts so much. The agent leaned against the wall as the pain receded, panting with the effort of containing himself, and trying not to picture Axia's dumbstruck expression. The interrogation studio he and the two Chauvanti women currently occupied was carefully soundproofed and contained a host of equipment to study every aspect of a subject on the other side of the one-way glass. The adjoining interview room was small, providing a good profile view of the human who sat in one of the two chairs. Things had started well enough when Axia had settled mid-air into the observation room, but then the comments started. Miver might hold a minor title, and she was certainly a professor at Empress Zagrika's Academy for Young Ladies. But staring at Tom Warwick seemed to have overcome any inhibitions Miver had, and she was proving to be rather zesty. And maybe you can't see it, Axia, but he so looks like Chandler. I just can't help it. I know you never knew him, but if you changed this human's coloration and gave him tasks, he would be a spitting image. Mivere sighed as she gazed wistfully at the screen. Watching a mortified Axia quickly turn multiple shades of blue, almost set off Tanu again. As he entered the human's details for the recording log, Axia looked frozen to the spot. And that silver hair, Mivere forged ahead, oblivious to Axia's discomfort. All right, it's mostly brown, but the silver is just right. And the brown just makes him look exotic. Raw. Goddess. That looks like a nut I'd like to crack. Tanu was always conscious of his appearance to others, but he barely managed to step briskly out of the room without looking like he was running. Taking a few deep breaths, he looked up and down the corridor. No other agents were in sight, thank the goddess, and he took one more gulp of air. Without the proper time to prepare, he still wasn't looking forward to this interrogation, but the look on Axia's face was a picture he would treasure in his mind forever. At least he was ready to face the interview now, except he'd left the human's file in the other room. Looking back at the door to the studio, Tanu felt his lips wanting to quirk up, and he slapped himself on the thigh. Stop it, man. Get a hold of yourself. Taking a moment to brace himself, Tanu gracefully stepped back into the room, just forgot by notes. As he grabbed up the folder from the table, Axia looked like the deeps were going to swallow her whole. Mivere seemed far from ready to wind down, and I'm telling you, Axia, that, that is a silver valpan if ever there. Tanu managed to get the door closed as fast as he could, sucking hard on his lips, but it was just no use. <laughs> It wouldn't have mattered if the Empress herself walked down the corridor, as Tanu gave in to a helpless fit of the giggles. Tom sighed, checking his watch again. The waiting game had yet to reach the half-hour mark, but it felt much longer. The room was comfortable, at least. Pleasantly warm and painted in a crisp, clean grey. After being shown into the room by the Corporal, he sat in one of the two chairs that faced each other across a table and... Waited. It could be worse, he thought, as he shifted in the chair. I could be at the BMV. Not that I have much choice anyway, he thought, as he stared at the door, willing it to open and get this show on the road. For a wonder, it did. Tom had only seen a few Chauvanti men before, but if the agent noticed any surprise on Tom's face, it didn't show as he swept into the room and set a folder down on the table between them. His surprise only grew as the little shill addressed him in flawless English. Hello, Mr. Warwick. The agent gave a polite nod of his head. I do apologise for the delay. I just needed to gather a few things, and I didn't expect you here quite so early. My name is Agent Tanu, and I'm with the interior. He placed a badge on the table for Tom to inspect. Please, can I get you something to drink? Some water, perhaps? Tanu nodded when Tom shook his head. Do you know why we have brought you in, Mr. Warwick? Can't say I do, Agent Tanu, he replied with an apologetic shrug. 
Between his flawless English and his amiable manner, Tom couldn't help but return the charming smile. The purple man seemed to radiate warmth, with a smile like something had just made his day. As the agent delicately slid into the opposite chair and looked him in the eye, he felt his shoulders relaxing. Maybe this won't be so bad after all. Would you care to hazard a guess? Tom knew he was no expert on body language, but he would have had to be blind to miss the change in his demeanour. The agent was still smiling, but it had grown cooler, no longer quite reaching his eyes. The agent settled into a friendly posture, watching Tom expectantly. The question echoed in his mind. It wasn't like he had much of a social life these days, and there were depressingly few possibilities. Christ, it must be Jeff, he thought. The kid finally seemed to own up at the last meeting. What the hell could he have run off and done? Tom sank a bit lower into the chair, which suddenly felt a lot less comfortable, and deliberately clasped his hands in his lap to avoid placing his anxiety on open display. It's possible I might, Agent Tanu. Please, just call me Tanu. The little agent smiled earnestly. Let's just go over a few things and you can go home once everything is sorted. All right, Tanu, as long as you call me Tom. Glancing down at the file folder, it suddenly looked much thicker than he liked. What can I answer for you that isn't already in there? I'm guessing all of that is mine. It is, but I'm afraid I can't read minds. Files only say so much, and I hoped you might help make sense of some things for me. Tanu gave the folder a pouty look, then smiled cheerfully at Tom. Why don't you tell me why you think you're here? Well, let's see, Tom started off. My name is Tom Warwick. We aren't at war, so my old rank and serial number don't really figure into things. Born in Indianapolis. Graduated with degrees in history and philosophy. Full ratings as a commercial pilot that expired a long time ago. Tom was slowly becoming aware of just exactly how warm it was in the room, as Tony watched him with an amiable smile and a nod here and there. Just listing off harmless facts that your Vanti must already have on record seems safe, and he hoped Tanu might react to something and give up a clue if this was something besides Jeff causing a problem. I joined the US Air Force and separated as a captain before you arrived, though you still keep one of those codes on my ID card. I did well with some investments and retired maybe two weeks before the Imperium showed up. Marital status? Widowed. Though I'm sure you know that too. Moved away from Indianapolis afterwards and settled here where I spend my time visiting a social group twice a month, and raid the library to find good science fiction. Tanu only counted his head with a soft smile, so Tom decided to shift gears in the conversation. You people ruined David Drake for me. Anything he wrote about the Slammers reads like the evening news these days. Tanu watched as Tom leaned forward, and he suddenly produced an odd accent. Are my eyes really brown? Tanu blinked in spite of himself, as Tom settled back. What? No, your eyes are grey, not brown. I'm sorry, but I don't understand. Tom looked bemused and heaved a sigh. You take over the world, march through Times Square in black uniforms. And after all that, you still haven't watched Casablanca? Now there's a crime against humanity. Or a crime against irony. Maybe both. Ah, a reference to a movie or a show then. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with it. Perhaps I should be. Tom rubbed the corner of his eye as he processed that. Yeah, sorry. It's just borrowing a line from the film. If you ask me the greatest movie ever made, there isn't anyone who will say it's not one of the top ten. So, it's named after the city. Tanu scribbled down the name, looking earnestly at Tom. I love your movies, though I don't recall that one. Is it recent? What's it about? He leaned forward with unabashed interest on his face. About? It's about war, loss, regrets, friendship, and a world turned upside down. It's about love lost and found again. And maybe it's a little bit about redemption. You might like it a lot, and... He raised an eyebrow with a wiry smile. The male lead never takes his shirt off. Tom chuckled as Tanu blinked in surprise. Ah, uh, but you have my apologies. Your English is perfect, and I guess I haven't talked to anyone I don't know in a while. Old jokes may stand the test of time better than most monuments, but perhaps not between planets. 
Tanu underscored the name of the film, and then set the pen down. I... I think I have to give that one a try, Tom. I'll watch it tonight. Thank you so much for the recommendation. I always enjoy learning something new. Counting his head just slightly, he pushed on. That was a fairly good summary of your file, at least broadly. But I noticed that you still didn't say why you think you're here. Tom and Tanu looked at each other across the table, the silence lingering between them. Tom managed not to fidget. He tried to dodge the question and Tanu called him on it. Tom blinked first. I go to a self-help group every two weeks, he sighed, running a hand through his hair. We're supposed to talk about our feelings about the invasion and all the things that's happened to us. I expect you want to know about a kid I see there named Jeff. He talks a lot and has a bad case of not thinking first, but there isn't anything behind it. You might even just give him a little room. I think he's starting to grow up, and you'll never have any real problem with him. Tanu nodded, carefully making notes, as Tom talked more freely, asking a few extra questions about the group in general, and Jeff in particular, before looking back and giving Tom a satisfied nod. Excellent. That helped clear things up, Tom. I appreciate your candor, and while I have to exercise my own judgment, I'll take your words into consideration. Tanu paused to tidy away the pen and notepad on top of the folder, and settled back a bit as if the interview were coming to a close. The way you said it makes it sound like you don't talk much. I promise it's just us sitting here. If you don't mind my prying just a tiny bit, I have to ask, what are your feelings about the Imperium? Axia sat on the other side of the glass and watched her partner with unbridled admiration. It helped that Miv Air had kept to her promise and remained silent since the interview began. She was watching the human as closely as ever, but it was the kind of attentiveness that Axia usually saw on other agents giving interviews. Or teachers watching their students, I suppose. Axia had taken in the conversation as Tanu carefully built a rapport with the subject and sighed as Warwick fell to talking about the minor subject being tracked in Group 143. The human name Jeff Carver was known to promote anti chauvinty propaganda, but Axia had seen the note in his file. Jeff was considered something of a useful idiot, but that was his best feature. The interior monitored every move and phone call Jeff ever made, just in case he came into contact with someone competent. Tanu just lets them talk, and they invent their own reasons while he just casts the gill net. It's uncanny. She watched as the conversation continued to unfold. Still, something in the back of her mind bothered her. What had the human said? She really had meant to read his folder. She actually even skimmed it after getting the message that Aunt Miver had landed, but the human had been brought in so fast that even Tanu hadn't had his customary time to review the file. Tanu was fastidious about records, and Axia wished she could muster half his scrutiny for the fine details, but there just hadn't been time. No wonder he'd been extra grumpy with her. Glancing down at her copy of the subject's folder, she flipped it open and started to look through it casually while listening to the pair talk. The name and place of birth were correct. Past and current places of residence were odd though, and there was a notation. Axia flipped through the folder to the addendum and started to read. She was barely past the first paragraph when she felt her stomach begin to churn. Oh, sweet goddess! That is quite a question, Tanu. Do you mind if I ask one of my own? Tom seemed to deflate a bit on himself as Tanu watched, but the moment passed quickly. When Tom looked back at him, Tanu felt like he was looking at another man. Tom didn't seem quiet or tired any longer. His gaze was different. As he maintained his picture of perfect innocence, Tanu weighed this new Tom. Not sharp like anger. Keen. Finally, we're getting somewhere. We have the real man coming out. Certainly, Tom. I get to give a lot of interviews, but I don't often get to just talk like this. I really appreciate the movie tip, and, well, I just want to know what you think. Please, ask me anything, he said brightly. Are you married, Tanu? Tom paused before adding, do you have children? Tanu felt his brow twitching towards a frown at such a personal question, but kept the smile on his face as he bobbed his head. I have two wives. 
A son that's just about to start school, and my first wife is expecting a daughter. He shrugged. I haven't been back on Earth that long, so I was really hoping you could share what you think with me. Things have changed since my last tour. The silence hung in the air, as Chauvanti and Human looked to one another. Tanu was nearly convinced that Tom wasn't going to speak, and that he would have to coax him back out of his shell, when Tom nodded, slowly. Two wives and a boy. That's good. I had a daughter, but given the differences, I guess having a daughter for me is like having a boy for you. That's good. Really, that's good. Daughters are special. I had a wife. I had a daughter. We lived on the northeast side of Indianapolis, and my daughter, Jess, was staying with us for a few weeks while she moved to change jobs. She was out of college and on her own, so I was just happy to have her there and spending a little time, you know. I expect it's hard for you to be so far away from your family, but trust me, it gets a lot harder when they leave home. Tom shifted a bit in his seat, but his eyes never left Tanu's. Now, I've had a lot of time on my hands to learn about the Imperium, how we're being protected from the awful things in the bigger universe, and how you're here to help us. How we're a part of the Imperium now. That's all well and good, but at its centre, the Empire is a military machine, isn't it? I expect you never heard of a Brack before you got here. The idea of a base realignment and closure, where a military actually shuts down dozens of bases to surplus and hands them back to the local towns, probably just doesn't happen all that often in the Imperium, as far as I've ever heard. There I was, living about a mile north of old Fort Benjamin Harrison. The afternoon you landed, my wife and daughter drove over to pick up a few things from the grocery and a piece of a dinner. I was sitting at home reading when one of your ships wiped Ben Harrison off the face of the earth. All the punch of a pocket nuke without the fallout. He gave a mirthless snort. Very thoughtful. Tanu felt the world shift out of control as the memory of old briefings came back to him. So, there I was when the windows on the south side of the house shattered. You people prepped to invade us for years, learn most of our major languages. You knew our leadership structure. You studied our military and our technology. But when the time came, someone screwed up. Whatever intel unit you had that was supposed to validate targets probably never even conceded of a brack. No one ever checked, did they? Your fleet hit way too many retired bases for it to be a coincidence. Whoever was supposed to choose your target list just saw military base and tossed it on the pile. In a split second, the Imperium killed my wife and my daughter. A shard of glass killed my dog when the windows blew in. If I'd been three feet to the left, I'd be dead too. With one push of a button, the Shulvanti Imperium wiped everyone and everything I had to live for right out of existence. As if they'd never been. Tanu remembered the situation all too well, as Tom laid out a cold agony. When the Imperium discovered its error, the interior had contained news of the Brack strikes and coverage of other events as the occupation took hold. Time and careful management of the media had kept some of the stories from getting traction, but the after-action report on the civilian death toll sent a ripple of shock through command. Buried as deeply as possible, time had only made the shame of the secret grow for the Shorvanti who knew. So, you're a family man, Tanu. You tell me, what would you think of any institution that murdered your wives and your children? All thanks to a fucking clerical error. Axia forced her jaw closed and looked over to Miver. Her aunt sat transfixed while tears slowly streamed down her cheeks. That poor, poor man, she whispered. Axia handed her aunt the box of tissues, kept near for such a purpose. Agents of the interior were trained to deal with the most difficult interpersonal situations, but it wasn't unknown for a new girl to break down into hysterics, watching some man being grilled on the other side of the window. Training was one thing, but Axia had seen more than a few newly vetted agents ball, and Miver was doing better than most. I know we came to liberate them, Axia. I studied it for two years before receiving my grant, but this... I never dreamed it was like this. Axia reached over and held Miver's hand. The landing was... That is, there were misunderstandings. Choices were made that seemed like the right thing at the time. 
But this... Axia, there has to be something to be done for this poor man. Something. Anything. Axia gave her hand a squeeze. I'm sorry. We can't bring back the dead. I don't know what we could ever do for him. Tanuka counts on one hand the times an interview had turned on him quite so drastically. Tom needed an answer, though. It was necessary to move the interview forward. Tony felt the mask he made himself wear all too keenly, as he reached past his sympathy to regain control of the situation. Tom didn't fit the profile of a blossoming resistance fighter, but the story he was telling could never come to light. Too much of Earth was actually starting to settle into an uneasy green zone, and the idea of setting the area ablaze again was unthinkable. Tanu nodded as he gave a sad smile. That sounds... nearly unbearable. Tom nodded slowly. The Imperium came, and it fucked up. It happened in our military more times than I could count, and you've actually tried to do the best you could. Better than a lot of occupations in our history, if I'm being honest. And the Shilvanti I've met are just regular people. They never had a hand in what happened. He paused, then shook his head. I hate it, but I'm still not enough of a hypocrite to say these things don't happen. It just happened to me. And after a long while, I decided that Claire and Jesse wouldn't want me chewing myself up with hate. They'd have wanted me to get on with my life, too. But that's just been more than I've had to give. We have therapists who might be able to help, Tom, he said quietly. The Imperium can treat PTSD, though it's harder with time. I'd be willing to look into it. Tom's gaze speared into Tanu, anger flaring in his eyes. Those little pills you have? Yes, I've heard all about those. I had a friend get PTSD after too many combat tours, and one of those would have saved him years of heartache, but tell me something. They take the pain away and let you cope with events? Guess your head back together while you adjust to whatever it was that happened? That's a bit simple, but yes, you have the basic idea. It's something I could set up for you, if you'd like. Tanu, I know it's not current events, but we had a Second World War. One side, the Germans, made mass use of a drug called Pervitin. It let you march for days without sleep and feel like nothing could touch you. It was also addictive as hell and after a while it fried your brain. Oh, they marched all over Europe, but after a year or so the simple fact was their entire army was hooked on speed. Tom, it's not at all the same thing. Our medications help soldiers deal with deep trauma and return to a normal life. You have to see that, don't you? What I see, Tanu, is that your soldiers came and smashed anything in their way flat, no matter what it cost in pain and lives. No one says anything, but I'll make any wage you like that for a long time your medics were handing those out in buckets. Tell me, what's it like for an empire to come down and make clerical errors, and then the inconvenient regrets just go away? Come down, wreck lives, and it's... Good job. Pills all around, girls. He leaned forward in his chair. Did the intel unit that was supposed to check your targets take those pills? His eyes narrowed, boring into Tanu's. Have you? Once, thought Tanu. And for an instant, he had to wonder how many officers and members of the nobility had shown excessive zeal because their training failed, or something else. Tom slumped back in his chair. Thank you, Agent Tanu. You've been very kind. I appreciate the offer of therapy, but I've done my grieving. You tell me you think you know how I feel, and I hope you never, ever do. Tom sighed, looking as though all the life had left him. The real kicker is, I don't really have anything to live for. And if I'm being honest, I haven't tried. I got past the anger, but what do you do when there are no pieces to put back together? There's only just so far down you can go before you hit bottom. It kind of reminds me of a story I heard in the Air Force. A colonel flew his plane into a base in Greenland. The guy was in an awful mood, and he started to take it out on the kid who came to service his plane with the honey truck. And that's the service truck we used to pump the latrines. Well, he started dishing it on the kid pretty hard. When the kid just looked at him and said, Sir, I'm 18 years old. I'm an airman basic stationed in Greenland and my only job is to pump the shit out of your airplane. Tom and Tanu spoke at the same moment. Just what do you think you can do to me? 
Tom's face split into a weary grin, while Tanu mentally thanked the goddess for a way past the conversation. Looks like some jokes do transcend worlds after all. Though, to be fair, Tom, I wouldn't be surprised if soldiers have been telling their story ever since the treen duty was invented. You're probably right, he sighed. Anyway, does that take care of why I'm here? We can't let him walk out the door after stirring up this mess and not watch him. By the deep, the thing we needed most is for him to not talk, and we didn't even know it. Tony felt his smile start to glaze over, as the notion of bad outcomes rolled out before him. When his on the pad chimed, Tanu nearly jumped out of his skin. Ah, excuse me, this isn't usual. Just let me get this. Tom nodded, amiably, as Tanu held up a hand to an earpiece so small he hadn't even noticed. Yes? Yes? Yes, I know she has a writ to operate. Yes, I know that. Wait, she what? How is that a... Yes. Right, fine. We can't keep her from asking, but... Yes, fine, I'll let him know. Tanu's smile took on the manic edge of a man hang gliding over hell as he turned back to the table. Actually, Tom, there's someone who would very much like to meet you.